It's a Friday. Week is coming to an end, so we're going to get right into it on Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Lisa Garvin, Layla Tassi, and Laura Johnston. And I've been meaning to point out that we have updated our daily newsletter And Laura is writing a little note at the top each day to kind of bring some relevance to one of the top stories in it. It's called The Wake Up, and it's free. It rolls over everything you need to know when you wake up in the morning, and you can sign up for it at cleveland.com slash newsletters. Laura, you've been getting some pretty good reaction to that, to the note you're putting at the top, right? I just got a really nice note from a reader this morning. But yeah, I wrote about how I don't like to pay for parking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Let's begin. Mike DeWine and Nan Whaley were in the same building on the same day to talk about the same issue. Lisa, was this anything we could classify as an actual debate? No, because they did not appear <laughs> together, and there's no indication that they even crossed paths at this event. But yesterday, both of them appeared as speakers at the Vote for Ohio's Kids Leadership Forum. They spoke separately. DeWine went first. He had a speech and a Q&A session that went for about an hour, and then Nan Whaley appeared after him about an hour later. So during his speech, DeWine unveiled his proposal for Ohio children, including expansion of Medicaid, publicly funded child care for low-income families, and more money for foster care and mental health support for postpartum mothers. He also talked about behavioral health research and uh, removal of lead pipes. Nan Whaley, in her speech, she talked about long-term funding for child mental health and addiction treatment. She did accuse of DeWine of cutting funding to reduce overdose deaths in Ohio, doing that in order to take care of the very wealthy in the state. And, you know, this, uh, you know, like I said, they didn't appear together. It's not even clear that they ran into each other. And we're not sure. We have, you know, extended an invitation, we at Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer on the editorial board, to have an endorsement meeting, which he has said he would attend, although he hasn't accepted it yet. And, of course, he's not doing any debates. He really probably doesn't need to because he has a double-digit lead over Nan Whaley. But Nan Whaley says, well, his refusal to debate her is anti-democratic and cowardly. Yeah, I, I'm disappointed that he didn't have the debate. I, I thought that it wasn't a disaster that he didn't debate Jim Renacci because he was a cartoon character running against him and been saying ridiculous things. Nan Whaley is a serious candidate, and th- this is the one time every four years where Ohioans get to assess the direction of the government. So he should have done the debate. I thought for sure, based on what he had said when he turned down the debate, that he would do our endorsement interview. He always has. He even did it with Jim Renacci. But I don't know. I'm I'm a little less confident now because they already uh, block the one day. And in the negotiations going forward, they're asking questions to make it sound like they're nervous. If he doesn't ever appear against her, that's really going to be kind of a a stain on him. He should face his opponent at, at some point in some venue. If it's not us, then do it in a debate. Do it somewhere where Nan Whaley gets to challenge him and he gets to defend his record. Well, and he has said that, you know, that appearing with us would be a de facto debate. And that was his reason for not participating in debates. I do believe there is maybe a scheduling issue here for the governor, but we'll, we'll have to see. It was supposed to be next week, but we'll have to see, you know, whether we can get that nailed down. Yeah, our format, I I would argue it's better than the debate format that you normally get. In the normal debate format, it's a question and a talking point. Ours are pretty pretty good. The editorial board's members ask questions that are provocative, and the candidates get to challenge each other, and it's all usually very civil, although one time Mike DeWine did slam his fist on the table to demand to be heard. Uh, But I I hope he follows through and lives up to his word and does join us for that endorsement interview. It's today in Ohio. Caitlin Durbin took a deeper dive into the debate about renovating the existing Cuyahoga County Jail rather than building new, something that is the subject of a consultant's report and was debated for hours in a session this week. Layla, what are some of the fine points of this debate? Yeah, at the steering committee meeting this week where members eventually voted against buying that toxic site for the new jail, DLZ Architecture did finally present their their long-awaited findings on whether renovating the existing Justice Center structures is a feasible option. And overall, I think you could really 
bend their conclusions to fit either side of this debate, depending on how you tilt this prism, (laughs) because the consultant did lay out a potential plan for how the county could overhaul the jail to improve the conditions and increase some bed space and accommodate some of the county's ambitions for a rehabilitative care model. But he also pointed out that a renovation can't accomplish every goal on the county's wish list. And that was really the scope of the analysis that the county hired him to do. So he was kind of like, if the county is hell-bent on accomplishing those goals without flexibility, renovation is probably not the answer. Renovation probably cannot provide optimal natural light, maximize efficiency by relocating all programming and services inside the housing units, and meet every one of the other objectives officials have that a new jail would accomplish. Renovation would require <clears throat> an, an extraordinary amount of work and he and the, he did outline what it would take. They wouldn't be able to get away with double bunking in single cells anymore if they decided to renovate. They would, and that would really reduce capacity of the of the renovated jail. But if the county builds a central utilities plant to house all mechanical functions for the entire Justice Center complex, it could move. HVAC systems and other equipment out of the facility, creating space to reorganize and expand into the basement. And that would also make it easier for public work staff to perform maintenance outside of the housing units. So they they could also remove walls to create more natural light in the day spaces and move some of the jail functionings closer to housing units. But that too would reduce overall capacity. And then there's the question of whether tearing down only Jail 1 and renovating Jail 2, the newer jail tower, is an option. And we've been talking about that on this podcast. The problem is that Jail 1 houses all the core functions, including intake and booking. And so you'd need to build something else and then demolish, he said. So you just really need Jail 1, and that's the one with all the problems. And the cost of all this work is untold, especially given the neglect over decades on the building. I mean, Armin Armin Budish, in anticipating the construction of a new jail, eventually never bothered to invest in the existing facilities. Yeah, although Jail 2 is less than three decades old. I wish there was a deeper study on Jail 2. Maybe maybe it is prohibitively expensive. I just wish there'd been a focus on that because if you could figure out a way to make use of that without it being prohibitively expensive to redo it and tore down Jail 1, you could build the kitchen, you could build the HVAC, you could build the central booking facility there. Uh, and then that gives you options for other kinds of treatment at an offsite facility. I mean, Lee Weingart has proposed this. Of course, he proposed building it on the juvenile justice place, which he's sticking with. I and mean, it's one of the problems with Lee Weingart. When, when he learns that something he's proposed has issues, he, he just doubles down says, no, it can be done. It can be done when it's never going to be done. He's still doing it. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'm going to have a schematic that could go there and nobody's going to put the, the new jail there. It's just a bad idea. But the jail two part of it is interesting. And I just don't feel like anybody's focused on it. I swear, Layla, it feels like somebody is going to profit hugely off of the bigger the contract they can get. You know, so it was 500 million. Now it's 700 million. And you don't feel like somebody's in there going, wait, let's think about the taxpayer. Okay, jail two may not be perfect, but what if it could save us $200 million in taxpayer money that would allow us then to fix up the courthouse and not have to build a new courthouse or something? But it just seems like everybody keeps saying, no, no, build new, build new. And, you know, the price is going up. We got to do it fast. I think that's that's the other thing is like we are we're not getting any accurate costs associated with this project. I mean, and how are we to know what's what's real anymore when it comes to co- even this this analysis didn't include any costs with with these ideas, because this consultant said that's outside the scope of what I was asked to do. So I'm just giving, I'm just spitballing here. I mean, on top of that, there are costs associated with sending inmates elsewhere while the work is underway, and that has to be factored in. And how long will the project take, and how long do you need to rehome these inmates? So there's so much to consider with a project like this. And what it's going to take, we need a new county executive, which will have 
who establishes and maintains credibility because you just said it. We, we don't feel like you can believe a single thing we've been right. told. Nobody trusts Armin Budish. Nobody trusts this county council. Nobody trusts the contractors that they've hired because everybody seems to have a vested interest and, and you need somebody to say, I'm here for the taxpayer. Lee Weingart is saying that. Lee Weingart is saying, I'm going to save the money on this thing. It's just he comes through with only half-baked ideas. <laughs> and as soon as we look at him, it's like, well, that won't work, and that won't work, and that won't work. <laughs> he has the germs of good ideas, but he doesn't do the homework to come through with a substantive plan. And that's yeah, the case I'm here. tired of doing his homework, right? <laughs> <laughs> or actually, I should say, I Caitlin's tired of doing his homework. <laughs> I know. We've done more work on his tax plan and his read a plan and his jail plan than he has. <laughs> it's today in Ohio. The Guardians start their playoff run this afternoon. Lisa, who's the 83-year-old Guardians fan who has been at nearly every home game since his wife died in 2013? I got to say, I told my colleagues this morning, I don't think I've ever seen a better, more ideal story to publish as a team kicks off a playoff run, John Tucker just did a delightful job on this. Yes. One. And of course he's only been a guardians fan for one year and an Indians fan for about 50 years or longer actually. <laughs> but 83 year old Virgil Fry has attended Indians games since he was eight years old back in 1948. And that was the year that the Indians won the world series. He still remembers the starting lineup from that series. He lives in a little town called Bryan, Ohio, which is about three hours away from Progress Aggressive field. And he started out with just day trips. And then as it progressed, he started going for weekends and then he would go for like entire home stands. And Fry has stayed in the same hotel room, the same hotel and the same room off of I-71 in Middleburg Heights since 1985. And so he's been at that hotel across two owners and four name changes. And he met his wife, Marilyn, back in 1978 on the picket line of a factory strike. And they both shared a love of baseball. So he now had a baseball wife and they traveled together to going to Indians games. And they found this motel that he stays in driving around before the weekend series. And it was part of a routine. They would stay at this hotel in the same room. There was St. Bartholomew Catholic Church across the street. And they would go to the services on Sunday when they were there, although Marilyn was not a Catholic. Um, Marilyn, unfortunately, did get Alzheimer's and she went into a nursing home and died in 2013. And then Fry himself got COVID last October and he wasn't able to go and uh, he was driven to a Guardians game by somebody else. And he finally recovered enough to drive himself again. But he found that his old, old hotel was under renovation and he tried one nearby, but he didn't like it because, you know, he needs like, you know, uh, kind of, you know, access, you know, for an older person wants to stay on the first floor and close to the lobby and so forth. But he happened to run into the original owner of the, uh, the owner of the original motel that he stayed at. So he says, okay, we're under renovation right now, but you can have your old room back free of charge during the renovation. So he's staying in this room. He's got his, you know, uh, his, uh, guardians and Indians, you know, gear there in the hotel room. So yeah, this is, this is a great story. Here's a I, guy who's been a fan forever. I What I loved about it, and really John Tucker did a great job in the unveiling of it. I love somebody that just rolls out the little golden nuggets all through. And one of the, the most moving parts is after his wife dies, he, he goes, he decides to start going to almost all the home games. It's it, not long after. And he started walking around the ballpark every day mm. to get to know the names of and see the people who work there and turn them into his family. And it's so much so that when he got COVID, they realized he was missing and got together a get well card for him to, to wish him well. It's just such a such a nice story about a real and fan. you know the people at the motel you know he was friendly with them the people that cleaned the room and of course like i said he ran into the owner and the owner was so pleased to see him it's like here you know we're going to give you a room sure there are mattresses in the closet but you know here's your room free of charge yeah it's just a great story yeah, I, I send a note out every day on subtext talking about what we're working on. And today I just sent a note saying, hey, look, you don't want to miss this one. I don't do this, but you need to go read this story because it's that good. So check it out. It's on cleveland.com. Look it up by searching on John Tucker's name. It's today in Ohio. 
Laura, I think you're back. Which Ohio school district is first in terms of test scores, according to recent Ohio school report cards? And there's a reason I gave this question to you. Sorry, Chris, it's not stolen. It's my district, which is why I will try not to feel bad if my kids score below the district average on their state test. But out of all of the high schools in Ohio, uh, Rocky River was one of 54 that received a score of 100 or higher. And the highest was Rocky River at 108.404. There were a dozen others in Cuyahoga County and the six surrounding counties. But Hamilton County actually beat us with the most in this top percentile with seven schools in a performance index of 100 or higher. So basically, this is a story. You, you take a bunch of statistics. You can make them say whatever you want. You want Rocky River to be number one, you're going to manipulate those numbers to make them number one. This is all based on test scores. So this doesn't look at any of the things that the state looked at on the school report card with the five uh, stars, really. So it's not looking at early reading or closing the gap or a lot of those other measures. This is purely based on test scores. So I guess kids at Rocky River are really good at taking tests. <laughs> okay. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Late on Thursday, City Hall in Cleveland put out a press release about something that we've been wondering about for years. It's trying to move into the 20th century. Not the 21st, quite the 20th. Layla, <laughs> what are they trying to do? They're seeking to replace the city's parking meters with a new, more modern, smart system that can take credit cards or payment through an app. So the city put out a request for proposal Thursday looking for companies that are capable of replacing all of the city's 2,500 single-space parking meters and 26 multi-space parking kiosks. They have to be able to provide a variety of contactless ways for people to pay. So we're talking about Apple or Google Pay or through an app or QR code. They want to get this technology out in the street by next summer. Mayor Justin Bibb is touting this as a really customer-friendly and convenient way to do parking, though it's unclear if this is going to raise parking costs. A city spokeswoman pointed out that current parking rates are, are below market rate which sounds like that's a way of saying it is going to raise <laughs> parking costs. Yeah, for you to say it's unclear, it's crystal <laughs> it's clear. It's crystal clear. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, we were talking um, about how you know uh, the city of Columbus recently changed its parking meters to adopt a smart system. And some areas of the city did did see an increase in parking costs. And people down there, you know, some have criticized Columbus's change in parking technology for not providing reasonable accommodations for people without credit cards or the extra cell data that they need to process digital payments. So I'm wondering if Cleveland is going to see a sim similar debate over equity emerge here. Uh, what do you guys think? I, I don't know. I, I It's just been frustrating that as you go almost anywhere now, you have the ability to pay for parking through multiple means. But in Cleveland, you needed quarters. I mean, we all went down to the state of the school speech a few weeks ago, and we all had a tale to tell about finding parking oh because it's such a hassle. I mean, it's just amazing to me that Cleveland is always so late to the party. My question is, does anybody think they'll get this right? <laughs> well, actually, uh, first of all, I want to say what I want to see in a smart parking system. I want the app to tell me where the parking spaces are. That's what this needs to do. Hmm. Is that possible? Because I think it is. I think there are cities that are doing that so that you go to the app and, and it should be able to do that. Right. And it shows you the nearest spot. It shows you the, the nearest, nearest spot so that you can you're not driving around for twenty minutes around the block looking and looking, waiting for someone <laughs> to move. That's but they'd almost have to have motion detectors yeah. then like they have at the airport to do that. I don't know how you can do that unless they just tell you which ones are are expired. But that doesn't mean they're free. That just could mean there's right. scofflaws parked in front right. of them. I don't know. When you leave, you could be the Good Samaritan who, when you leave, like you, you know, click the app and, sh you know, shows that your space is available. Uh, nah. <laughs> I know cities are doing that. <laughs> Cleveland, catch up. I don't know. But go ahead. No, I to answer your question, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Lisa. Well, and I go downtown a lot, you know, and if I can't park for free on Euclid Avenue below 12th Street, I go down, you know, there are lots of uh, metered spaces. I always find a space on East 9th Street near Superior. It costs me a buck to park there for an hour, and I always remember to have quarters. I just, I don't really like, you know, I'm a cash and carry person. I've said this before, I like to pay cash. But, you know, I hate to use an app or even my credit card for such a small amount of money. It just seems weird. Haven't you ever been in the situation where you're, you're, you know, you, you plug in the quarters, you, you're running into whatever appointment you're dealing with and you're, you go over your limit, you, you know, you know, you got to be out there, but you're, you know, you're tied up in an interview or whatever you're doing. You come out and find that dang ticket (laughs) for 30 bucks on your window. (laughs) And now it's cost you all that to, to park for an hour. And it's just, you know, well, they're you not could, talking with this about, app, you could you could increase your time at the meter without even going back out to the street. Mm-hmm. But yeah. but they're not talking about getting rid of the coins, are they, Layla? I mean, you still have the option to pump quarters in if you wish. Oh, I was under the impression that they are. That's what the oh, equi- I, that's what the equity debate is about. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought that these had the option of of I parked in Lakewood recently, and the meter I think took quarters or. You could pay by credit card. I hope it's a system that allows people to pay by cash if they want for people like Lisa that don't want to do it on their credit card. Some people also don't want to be tracked. Exactly. And if you are paying with any kind of electronic currency, you can be tracked. It's just, it's not convenient now. If you don't have the quarters and you're looking around for a lot that does take that kind of payment, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, I'm glad that that Justin Bibb is doing it. I think he said he was going to do this during the election. I think it's one of the things he talked about when he campaigned. I just hope they get it done and it works and that it's not ripe for corruption or something. It's today in Ohio. (laughs) Akron Mayor Dan Horgan announced earlier this week that he would not seek re-election next year. And Thursday, he sent out another announcement already offering his endorsement for a successor. Talk about letting the contest begin. Who does Horrigan support as the next mayor, Laura? This is Marco Somerville, not to be confused with Margo Somerville, who's his daughter, who's president of city council and not running for mayor. But Marco Somerville has been a deputy mayor under Horrigan his entire time. He actually was elected city council in 1987, the same year that Don Plasquelic was announced, elected mayor. So he's a longtime public servant and has been serving in the cabinet of the mayor since 2013, first under Plasquelic. But you're right, we got this announcement, I think it was like seven o'clock uh, yesterday. I was on the elliptical machine and I was like, another Dan Horrigan announcement at a weird time where it says, I will not be taking questions on this. Well, I, the other thing I, I'm surprised at is that he's putting his thumb on the scale. Now, we know from Cleveland that doesn't necessarily work. Frank Jackson tried to put his thumb on the scale for Kevin Kelly, and Justin Bibb obliterated him. I, I just, why not let the yeah, contest I mean, it begin? might not Why work, not let but... people run and and have the voters decide? I mean, to put your, to, to, to say now, yeah, I'm not running, but elect this guy. Well, I don't know. Maybe it'll backfire. Maybe people will be annoyed that he did that. There's a really long time before the race. I mean, we're talking more than a year, so a lot could happen. And who else, you know, who knows who's going to throw their hat into the ring for this? We already have an Akron City Councilman, Shamus Malik, uh, Joshua Schaefer, a Chapel Hill resident, and Jeff Wilhite, who currently serves on Summit County Council. Akron, like Cleveland, is a very Democratic city. So the primary will probably be the biggest field of candidates. So we'll see that next May. But yeah, there's a lot of time for people to jump in. Well, and the other thing is, you know, Corrigan could have a scandal before the primary where his endorsement would be not something you'd want. Uh, I just, it was surprising it came so quickly uh, after his announcement. Well, and Marco it's- Somerville knew that Dan Horgan was going to retire, right? So in his statement, he said he had time to think about this already and knows he wants to be mayor. Okay. It's today in Ohio. Health officials keep predicting another coronavirus surge, but are we seeing any signs of that? Lisa, what do the numbers show a week into October? Well, the numbers show kind of a mixed picture. Um, the weekly Ohio cases, though, for this past week were just under a th- just under 10,000, uh, 9,997. And that's down from over 12,000 the prior week. And this is the first time Ohio has been below 10,000 new cases a week since April of this year. But on the other hand, 
hospitalizations and ICU admissions are up. Hospitalizations last week were up by 369. ICU admissions were up by 27. So I'm not sure what kind of story that's telling there. So this last week, that average is about 1,428 cases a day. Um, We peaked in Ohio back on July 28th. We had 29,876 cases, and the numbers started dropping steadily, except for a very slight bump in late August. So yeah, we right now, the total Ohio deaths are 39,000, since the pandemic began, 39,856 people have lost their lives to COVID in Ohio, and the total Ohio cases are 3.15 million. Yeah, we were talking in the newsroom yesterday about the frightening statistics that have been released about long COVID and how significant a percentage of the population has it. I think Gretchen Crohn's going to do an update looking at that uh, because that's the fear is that, that, yeah, the numbers have gone down, but if we get another surge, does it result in a whole lot more people dealing with this just debilitating condition that lasts for months and months? And you'll recall, we talked about kids who get mm-hmm. it, having that 70% increased chance of getting things like diabetes. Right. So it's low now. And if people would go get that vaccine, we could keep it low because the, the virus wouldn't have receptive bodies to infect, but I don't think many people. Well, are and our, our vaccination rate is not great. Um, they, it's about 7.5 million Ohioans have at least one vaccination, but that's only about 67 and a half percent of the entire state population aged five and up. So we have a ways to go. Well, and at this point they need to get the bivalent one because that's what protects you from the Omicron fourth and fifth variants. And if you have it, And that variant can infect you. It can't mutate and we don't get another variant. It's just a wise time. Anybody who read that story about the long COVID symptoms, I would think that would frighten you because your odds are pretty high of having long-term fatigue and all these other things that keep you from being able to work. Uh, It's a shocking condition that nobody's quite figured out yet. It's today in Ohio. Ohio Stadium, the shoe, teams with people during the Buckeye games. And for its 100-year anniversary, Susan Glazer has given us an informative account of how it was built and enlarged over the years. A lot of people go there, probably don't know these details. What are the highlights? Well, apparently when they opened the stadium in October 1922, they thought it was too big with seating for (laughs) 62,000 fans until 70,000 fans showed up for their dedication game when the Buckeyes lost to the Wolverines 19-0. to And the Buckeyes have played a total of 597 games there since then, winning 78% of those matches. And Susan tells us that a community-wide campaign funded the stadium with $1.5 million it collected in the late 1910s. They even collected from the city's clergy. Uh, the, the school hired an Ohio State-educated Italy-loving architect who modeled the stadium's north end rotunda after Rome's Pantheon and the arches after the Colosseum. The two-tiered structure featured a curved end zone shaped like a horseshoe so that all fans faced the field. And then the stadium underwent a major renovation and expansion from 99 to 2001, which included new scoreboards, a new press box, new suites and club seats for a total increase in capacity of more than 6,000. At its largest, the stadium held just shy of 105,000 people, the third largest in the country behind Michigan and Penn State, today after the conversion in in 2019 of several thousand seats into the Loge Club, the stadium holds 102,780. Still, that's the third biggest. And another fun fact that I loved from the story, apparently there were once dorms located in the stadium, which were added to make college more affordable for students after the Depression, but they were renovated out in the 2000s. So students who lived there had to work in the stadium as part of their, I guess, uh, their keep. So I love that little fact. The guy who was giving her the tour once lived there, I guess, in the 80s when they were still functioning. And he said he has very fond memories of of that time. Yeah, it's a good look at the history of it. It's nice that a stadium has lasted 100 years because, as we know, they often get torn down in short order these days. We're already talking about the future of Brown Stadium, which is not 30 years old. 
It's today in Ohio, and that does it for Friday. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back on Monday. <laughs>